Good morning, or perhaps good afternoon, or good evening, wherever you may joy, be joining us from, and whatever time of day you are joining in and watching. We're just thankful that you are part of our Summit Church uh, family today, and we want to welcome you to our service and look forward to just joining with us and what God has for us today. Um, you know, as I was thinking through the service today, I thought, I didn't grow up going to church. And so if that um, resonates with you or identifies with you today, I, I just want to walk you through quickly what's going to happen this morning. I'm going to go through a, so just a very couple of short announcements, and then I'm going to lead us in a time of prayer. And prayer just very simply is me communicating with God. And you can join with me in that in your uh, wherever you are and just um, listening in as I communicate with God. And then our worship team is going to lead us in a time of just some great music that we've got for us. And then our lead pastor, Dave, is going to uh, communicate with us from God's word. And that's his, uh, uh, so often it's just his primary job with us to, to teach us and to communicate. And then we're going to wrap up with another song and we're just going to have a great time of just uh, this time that we're going to have together. And so if you've never... Um, been in a, a church service or never had a, a time of being in a service, that's just sort of the order of how things are going to go today. And if you're part of our church family, you already know all that, and so that's just um, a regular thing for you. So let me just go through those announcements that we've got for us. Um, if you have any needs or know of someone who does, we would love to be able to connect you with the church office, and so just uh, help us, and we want to help those who may have some financial needs or practical help, and we'll be glad to do that. Just call the church office and connect with us either online or through a phone call. If you'd like to connect with one of our pastoral staff, again, do the same thing. Contact the church office either online or through a phone call. Um, we're looking forward to and praying that we're going to be able to meet again in person. And so this coming week, you know that uh, our uh, chief medical officer, Dr. Bonnie Henry, is going to be making her announcement about what's going to take place. And so that health order is going to come out on Friday. And then we want to be ready just in case that she allows us to be able to connect through on, on in-person services. And so we're going to be ready at 9 a.m. and 11 for that reality. And so uh, you can go online and get your tickets as we have done previously. And so just be ready for that. And so we're praying to that end. And we invite you to pray with us to that end as well that we'll be able to reconnect here in person for services. If not, if the order just continues as it currently has been, then just um, be ready for our regular online services. But if we can gather in person as we're praying to that end, we ask you to just uh, go online, get your tickets, and come and join us here. And we'll be having two services, 9 a.m. and 11, here at the church. Giving, you can do that uh, through dropping your church, your gift off at the office, or do the uh, uh, online, service, online giving as well. And uh, there's boxes at the bottom that will direct you to that. Let's pray together. And just uh, bow with me as we um, engage with our good God in prayer. Heavenly Father, you're amazing. That you would invite us to communicate with you. That alone is just amazing. That you're not a far off distant being of some kind but rather, you sent your son to this earth some 2,000 years ago, inviting us through his death, burial, and resurrection to prove to us your incredible love and invite us into a relationship that allows us to have regular communication with you. And so, Father, today we want to do that right now to communicate with you. And Father... We just want to pause and say thanks. Thanks for allowing that. Thanks for us inviting us into that. And so we pray for our family of the week, Jerry and Marilyn. We pray that you would remind them of that incredible privilege that we can have communication with you. We pray for our two churches, the Kamloops Church of the Week, the Shepherd's Heart, and we pray for our, our uh, fellow sister church, Zion Baptist Church up in Terrace. We ask that you would remind them of your nearness and that they too would reach out to you in prayer in ways perhaps that they have not previously done and they would discover your incredible relational nearness and they would be touched by that this week. We pray for our ministry of the week, women's ministry and our mission of the week, Father Awana, that they would see new avenues 
of communicating the truth of who Jesus Christ is, and there would be fresh fruit through those ministries, Father. For your glory and for the good of our community, that Jesus Christ's name and his offer of salvation would be reached out to this great community of Kamloops. Lord, we'd pray for those who are grieving the loss of Leo, that you would be near to them and that they would sense your closeness. We pray for Carol V as she recovers from a broken hip and is now at home. We pray for Judy as she begins chemo. So many medical issues, Father, here beyond that go much beyond COVID. We pray for a young father who's resting at home and is on medication now. Pray for a young man who's recently been diagnosed with leukemia, that you would let him know that you are a God who knows each and every situation of our lives, and you don't ever leave us or forsake us, regardless of our medical situations. We pray for Brian and Len and Lori and Steve who are fighting cancer, that they too can reach out to you and you will hear them in the midst of their struggles. We pray for a quick and good recovery for Bob Cron as he recovers from surgery. Father, we thank you for his ministry in our midst. We pray that you would bless him. For those among us who are experiencing extreme stress because of COVID, this pandemic has gone on now for quite some time, and as this second wave hits, and for those who are in long-term care and can't have their loved ones near to them, may they know that there is one who is not ever barred from coming near to them and his name is the lord god almighty may they experience you father in fresh ways even this very week we pray for the homeschooling families who have few opportunities to get out and that they would be able to meet with other students and find creative ways to have their needs met we pray also for our governing leaders that this coming week father as they meet to make decisions that you would give them wisdom and they would be discerning what is best for our province. And that, Father, that we would be able to meet again together as church families, as church groups, as churches. Lord, that is our desire. And so we pray for that. Lord, we pray for the persecuted Christians in Iraq, that they who have had to flee from home, that they would be strengthened in their faith during these times of struggle. And that, Father, you'd give them wisdom and discernment during their persecuted times right now. We pray for the Bodha groups um, in India. They have a Buddhist tradition and the shamans who um, give them spiritual direction. But it is at a cost, Father, that they would discover that Jesus is the answer, not the shamans. And Lord, as I read through that, I I realized that they had asked for that there would be a disciple-making movement among this people group that would shake the foundations of their spiritual lives, and they asked to be blessed for all of eternity through this disciple-making movement. And so, Father, as I thought about that, I thought I would pray that for Summit Drive Church as well, that we would have a disciple-making movement afresh within our church as well, Lord, that would shake our foundations for all of eternity as well. And so, Lord, I pray that as we close this morning, that you would move freshly within our church family in a disciple-making way that would be rooted in the truth of God's word, that you would be glorified and honored, and that we would grow deeply in the faith, Father, in your word, and you would, again, be honored and glorified because of your goodness. And we give you right now, Father, all the praise and all the honor. In the matchless name of Jesus, we pray. Amen and amen. We turn it over to our worship team now as they lead us. This morning, we're going to sing a few songs, some really old, ancient songs, which have some great words and um, this first song is actually as, as, as uh, Russ was praying I was kind of looking through these words as well this song come thou fount and uh, it's kind of it's, it's essentially a prayer talking to God and asking God to um, in particular here come thou fount of every blessing tune my heart to sing your grace so as you're tuning in at home or wherever you are um, 
let's just pray that God would tune our hearts to the frequency that he's talking and that we would be able to sing of his grace and sing his praises and then feel uh, the wonders of his love. Fixed up. 
Thank you so much, team, for leading us today as we rejoice and celebrate what God has done. You know, I have no studies to back this up, but I would guess that for most of us, we came into this world, at least for the first days, weeks, and months, with the voice of one or more of our parents singing these songs to us and over us. Sometimes it was out of the sheer joy of the little ones, this gift now in our arms. Sometimes it was simply to soothe or calm the child. I can remember singing uh, Lullaby and Goodnight or Rockabye Baby or Jesus Loves Me sometimes a dozen or more times a night because when I sang, the crying stopped. For the voice of mom or dad come this sense of comfort and bonding. We sang with our kids as toddlers as well, that the Jesus loves me or, you know, the roly-poly song and, and many, many more. But simply singing, like without recorded music, I think it begins to fade as our kids begin to grow. Maybe there's a self-consciousness about how we sound that grows as our kids maybe are a little bit older as well, where it didn't matter what we sounded like when all we were doing was staring into the eyes of our little one, 
maybe desperately hoping that they would close their eyes. Today we're on part four of our series, Lovers in a Dangerous Time, Everyday Habits for Faith Formation. In the first parts, we really focused on um, habits that Jesus both modeled with his life and he taught about. Things like taking time for solitude, which really means paying attention to God, turning down the volume of other things in our lives so that we can hear Him and connect with Him. We talked about meditating on the Scriptures, like paying attention to what the voice of the living God was saying through His Spirit to our hearts, that we might be formed and shaped as we pay attention to the voice of the One who loves us. We looked at being on time, like the reality that God has built a rhythm, a beat into His creation. And human flourishing only comes as we find ourselves within that rhythm as well. And we've looked at prayer, this act of connecting with the living God. Now, Jesus models and teaches all of these things. Think of it like this. If you were to walk alongside of Jesus for those first years of his ministry, if you were one of the first disciples, you would see him practicing all of these. You would be taught about those practices. But if we learn to practice each of those things we've looked at so far, which is perhaps where in modern times many churches have focused on a discussion about spiritual growth. These are the things that you do. If you grew up in church, you might have sung a song like this, you know, read your Bible, pray every day, and you'll grow, grow, grow. And that's partly true but is desperately incomplete. Because if we follow Jesus in his ministry, we would also gather for corporate worship every single week. We would feast with others all the time. So my message for today and next week coming up is really going to push us into that more fulsome and well, fully Christian view of spirituality. I'll tr try to show that our spiritual health and growth have everything to do with our bodies, not just our minds, and with our connection to one another in corporate worship, in our life and community. And that's in addition to times of personal, valuable times, I might say, of personal uh, prayer and devotion and connection with God. You see, over the past 300 years, maybe a bit more, in Western history, what it has come to mean to be human has focused more and more on the individual. And our ideas around spirituality have been formed and shaped by that cultural force as well. Self-fulfillment becomes the theme of spirituality. True, every one of us needs to make a faith commitment personally and deeply, we have responsibility for what we believe and how we connect with God at a personal level. That's true. But that life, if it doesn't happen within the community of the body of Christ and with our whole selves, is missing so much of what it means to be God's people. In addition to the emphasis on individuality and how that works out in spirituality, one of the factors that actually feeds this vision is uh, what some scholars have called like an overly rationalistic vision of what it means to be human. Now, there's a famous dictum that uh, Rene Descartes has used. He says, I think, therefore I am. And there's evidence, uh, I guess, of how that has come to be played out in Western thinking. Uh, Christian philosopher James Smith he describes it like this, in, in other words, what I am is essentially an immaterial mind or consciousness, occasionally and temporarily embodied, but not essentially. He means this, he means that uh, the vision of what it means to be human is kind of like a stick figure with this big head on top. And what emerges, the picture emerges is what Smith calls bobblehead Christianity. Mammoth heads dwarf an almost non-existent body. So what do I mean by all this? Why, where, am I, where am I gunning with in, in explaining this? Well, I'm saying that the vision of what it means to be human that God gives us through the Scriptures, and especially in the fact that God Himself became one of us, was embodied, that He shows up in the flesh, it shows us that we are much more than simply thinking things. 
We are mind and body and soul and spirit things all bound up together, rolled into one. And that means how we interact with God and each other, our spirituality, you might say, is to involve our whole selves, bodies, and all. So that's where we're going today and and next week. And let's just pray as we begin. Our holy and good God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, we thank you that you have formed us, that you made us in a particular way, and we pray that over the next weeks we would dive into what that means even more for how we connect with you and others. Lord, help us grow in accordance what with the design that you have built into us for your glory and our joy. Amen. So today we're really going to zero in on a text from Colossians chapter 3. So if you have your Bibles, uh, I'd I'd love for you to turn and and look with me there. Um, This is a part of the letter, we're we're kind of in chapter 3, where Paul has already described a lot of the issues and big theological themes he needs to deal with. Now he's shifting to the really practical, everyday, like, how do we live as believers in this city kind of moment? So, Paul says this. I'm going to pick up at verse 12. Therefore, as God's chosen people, holy and dearly loved, clothe yourselves. I put on these clothes. Clothe yourselves with compassion, kindness, humility, gentleness, and patience. Bear with each other and forgive one another if any of you has a grievance against someone. Forgive as the Lord forgave you. And over all these virtues, put on love, which binds them all together in perfect unity. Notice these virtues are to define the life of God's people together, what it looks like to be uh, a Christian community. Compassion, kindness, humility, gentleness, patience, all of these, notice, are how we relate to each other. Like you couldn't possibly live this way unless you were in community, in connection with each other. We could put it like this too, the outcome or the goal of our life in Christ is to become like Jesus. The everyday habits that we've been talking about ultimately place us in union with God so that we would be formed and shaped to look in our character, our patterns of life, just like Jesus. And that especially comes out in how we relate to other people. And this is where I want us to press into more today. This process of transformation is both expressed in community, but it actually requires the community. The challenges, even the frictions of living in connection with each other, that's what actually helps us build Christ-like character. Really, we can only tell where we're at in terms of our spiritual health, only really tell when we get next to people who are different than us, and then we see how do we respond to that. Jesus says it like this, you can tell a tree by the fruit that comes from it. Like you can tell if a tree is a good tree or a bad tree based on what actually grows out of that tree, what grows out of your life. Is there quick and hearty forgiveness of those who have wronged you? Is there a compassion and a humility that flow out of you to others? Is there gentleness? Is there patience? That is what God is in the process of working into and then out of us. Does that excite you? Man, it excites me. That's what I want to become. I want to become like the person described here. I want us as a people, corporately, our body of Summit Drive Church, to look like that in our uh, connection with each other. I want everything that doesn't look like that to be trimmed out. I, I don't want to live impatient anymore. I don't want anyone to experience a lack of gentleness when we come in contact with each other. I want the beauty of Christ to be seen to the whole watching world as they look at how we function as a community. But we might wonder how. And that's what the practices are about that we've looked at so far. But let's take the rest of our time to focus in on a key practice that involves this communal aspect of formation and our bodies. Let's start at verse 15 now. Let the peace of Christ rule in your hearts. 
Since as members of one body, you are called to peace. Notice the emphasis on community. Everything that Paul is saying here is about our life together as the one body in Christ. Verse 16, let the message of Christ dwell among you richly. Just pause for a moment. I'm reading from the updated, like the 2011 NIV version right now, and it does a great job here. Since it brings out that the you is plural, among you. Unfortunately, many translations hide the fact that this is a plural, and there's no actually good reason for that. It's it's very much uh, just a, a translation work to bring out the plurality. They might say something like this, let the word of Christ dwell in you richly. And when we as modern readers, inundated with this individualistic frame of reference, we almost always hear you as a singular. Like this is about me as an individual. It's not. Praise be to God. What we're being asked of here is to let the message of Christ dwell among us richly. And then Paul says how? As you teach and admonish one another with wisdom through psalms, hymns, and songs from the Spirit, singing to God with gratitude in your hearts. And whatever you do, whether in word or deed, do it all in the name of the Lord Jesus, giving thanks to God the Father through Him. Notice first, all of what Paul has just said assumes connection with others. And this is really challenging, I admit, in our current moment, when we are actually not physically present with each other. For this moment, we actually have to uh, continue to be very intentional about reaching out and finding ways to connect with others. Man, that takes effort. It takes creativity. And just to be totally candid with you, one of the concerns that I have about our COVID moment is that we are forming habits of disengagement. Perhaps it's not intentional, but whereas our initial experience of the uh, COVID shutdown was this sense of isolation and weirdness, I think now we might be growing in an apathy toward meeting at all. And that concerns me. I, I recently heard a person say it like this, I think some people are using COVID as an excuse to withdraw and not engage with others. Boy, if that's true, and I think in some cases it really might be, we as followers of Jesus, we have to guard against that. We have to kick against that kind of darkness, to quote the Bruce Coburn song again. Pastor Jill suggested in our staff meeting that we need to encourage each other, and and to quote her, to take the opportunities that are acceptable in order to interact with others. Man, I agree. I know that conversations on the phone are not everyone's favorite thing. Maybe pick up the phone anyways. I know that Zoom meetings are not our favorite thing right now. They're not my favorite thing right now either. But maybe just show up anyways, whether it's with your grandparents on a Sunday afternoon or your life group or youth or young adults. Take those moments when you see others, maybe you pass them in the grocery store just briefly, or you're picking up your kids from school and you're standing next to them. Even if it's with a mask and six feet away, please, please don't let the distance become normal for you. We can't let that be the case. One of my concerns from this COVID era and not being able to meet in person for this extended amount of time for worship is that corporate gatherings, we might just kind of go, eh, it's not really that important to me because our habits do actually form us in certain directions. They they, they kind of shape us in a way, and I don't want that way to be against meeting together. There will come a day, and Lord willing, may it be soon, when we can gather again, of course in ways where we're paying attention to safety and, 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 and a measured way, absolutely, But please don't let COVID be an excuse for disengagement and disconnection. I know there are legitimate reasons why certain people really have to limit their exposure to others. Absolutely, we have to care about that. But check your heart too to see if you're not simply making an excuse to not gather 
once we are legitimately able to in a safe way. Second, I want us to point, uh, I want to point out that the corporate element of spiritual formation together includes singing. Notice what Paul doesn't say in this text. He doesn't say, praise God, uh, however you feel comfortable in ways that really suit your personality. You know, just in your mind or whatever you want. Over 50 times in the Bible, we are commanded to sing. Oh, wait, sorry. Did I say commanded? I'm sorry, that can't be right. Oh, no, it is. It says commanded. (laughs) Yes, I'm just being cheeky. Because how can we possibly be commanded to sing? Like to actually open our mouth and let the words and melody flow over our vocal cords out into the world. Like, God, you know how I sound. You know that I'm self-conscious about my voice. Maybe instructed is a better word then. But we are being asked in the imperative mood, which is just geeky Greek grammar terms to say, this is imperative that you do it. It is actually in the command mood that we participate in singing. Indeed, we're told to sing. Psalm 96, sing to the Lord a new song. Sing to the Lord, praise His name. Yes, sing. And notice, with creativity, a new song. Of course, this doesn't exclude singing old songs. Of course not. But there is a creative expression that has to be part of our life and worship. For singing new songs gives us fresh ways to express the wonders of what God has done. New songs are an avenue that can reignite and captivate our imaginations around the themes of God's love and His grace. So sing. Sing a new song and do it loud. Shout, it even says in places. Psalm 98, sing to the Lord a new song. Great. For he has done great things. Shout for joy to the Lord. All the earth burst into jubilant song with music. This is far from sleepy, too. Do you notice that? Jubilant song. Bob Coughlin, in an article, he puts the question like this. He says, the question is not, do you have a voice? Like, can you carry a tune? The question is not, do you have a voice, but do you have a song? Folks, we have a song. A song of love to the one who made us in love, who sustains us in love, the one who steps into the messiness of our world and our moments and gives his life away in agony to bring us hope and joy with him forever. As that hymn that we often sing, it puts it like this, this is my story, this is my song. Jesus, God come for us. Jesus, lover of my soul. Jesus, the hope of the nations. Again, Bob Coughlin, he asks, I think maybe what we might be wondering, like why? Why does God so often tell us not simply to praise Him, but to sing praises when we meet? Not just to pray and preach. Why sing? Why are God's people throughout history always singing? Why words and music and not just words alone? Why does God want us to sing? You might be wondering that. First, look at Zephaniah 3, 17. Here the prophet is speaking uh, the words for God over his people. And it says this, The Lord your God is with you, the mighty warrior who saves. He takes great delight in you. In his love, he will no longer rebuke you, but will rejoice over you with singing. What's God doing here? He's looking at his people and he's rejoicing over them. And then he sings a song. God sings. Just imagine that for a moment. Imagine this reality. God delighting over us, his people, and he is singing this song. You know, people who are in love, that's who sing. Parents who are holding a newborn baby and overcome with joy, those are the kind of people who sing, and God sings over you. It's almost too wonderful. And then Jesus, the night that he was betrayed, he leads his disciples from the Last Supper, and they're on their way to a mountain, and it says that he's leading them in singing. So why does God want us to sing? First point, because God sings. 
And God wants us to be like God. And this singing, it says something beautiful, is expressive and outward. A song communicates more than an idea, it communicates the emotion, it connects with the heart, the desire. The fact that singing plays such a major role in the biblical story speaks to the wholeness of who we are as God's people. For singing engages the mind through the lyrics, both the ideas that are expressed, but also the poetics of it. Sometimes you need to hear words put together in a certain way, and that opens up a whole new avenue for considering the realities and the beauty of God in a way that you hadn't before. So lyrics engage our mind both through the idea lens, but also through the imaginative lens. It's engaging our mind in both ways. It engages the body through the use of our diaphragm that inflates our lungs, that pushes air out and over our vocal cords, that creates the physics of sound waves. And it engages our hearts because it speaks to what we love, what we desire, what touches and stirs the deepest places in us. So second, singing engages the body and emotions. It reminds us that we're not simply bobbleheads, but fully embodied persons. So in singing, we engage our bodies in worship. Third, third, (laughs) singing serves our memory. People who suffer with Alzheimer's or other forms of dementia, they may forget the names of the most important people in their lives, their friends and family. But in a lot of cases, start singing a song from their childhood or their youth. And their brains are able to access where that song is stored in a place that's not affected by the disease. That's what melody does. It actually stores memories differently. And God knows that. Of course he does. No wonder he calls us to sing. That's why we so often use singing in teaching, the ABCs song. Or for me, I still sing the song of the books of the Bible when I'm trying to remember the order of the minor prophets. We too often have amnesia of the heart. Our hearts forget what is true about God and about ourselves, about his love for us and the world he loves. So we sing to serve our memories, to reignite what we know is true and at the deepest level of our being. Fourth, Songs do teach and help us to connect with God. It's not one or the other, it's both and. That's why Paul mentions in our text that the message of Christ dwells among us and we express and experience that with psalms, like that's the songbook of the Bible, and hymns and songs of the Spirit. Our songs help us connect with the living God even as they tell the story of God and about who He is. I think that's why Paul mentions the various forms of songs. Some are rich in their teaching role. Others are intended to be intimate, simple expressions of love. Still others help our hearts to say what we don't know how to say because we're in such deep grieving or loss, like the Psalms of Lament. So Paul says we actually need a variety of types of songs. Many of the so-called worship wars where people fight about what we should be singing in church, I think they'd be settled just by looking at this text. We need songs that teach the faith. Now, all songs must be theologically accurate, like they, they, they all have to say things that are true and give us words that are true to say, but not all are in a teaching mode. We need songs from the Spirit. These are heartfelt simple songs of affection. These are prayers of intimacy. I would say that some of the most significant moments of spiritual growth in my life have come from singing simple songs from the Spirit that just led me to sit with God and to experience His tenderness and His love for me. My faith and ministry have been deeply enriched by seven years of graduate and doctoral level theological studies. I mean, hundreds of hours in lectures, hundreds of books. uh, Yeah, actually probably in the hundreds of papers written about it all. But all of that would mean nothing without the actual encounter with the living God 
who sings his tender daddy heart over me. And in my most desperate moments of loss, it's psalms. They give me a voice to express the heartache that I have. They enable me to express the pain and remind me that God is with me even in the pain. So yes, sing about the glory of God in a way that serves to teach and remind us of what is true. Yes, sing to God these songs of love and tenderness and praise with thanksgiving, as Paul says. Sing in a way that speaks to your own heart like the psalmist tells us to. And sing as a chance to encounter the living God, but more too. This is the fifth thing. Sing for others. I, I have a friend um, from Prince George. His name is Tyler Horton. Uh, we actually overlapped uh, at our studies at Acadia. He was working on his Master of Arts in Old Testament studies at the time. Uh, he, it, he and his family are currently in Cambridge. He's He's doing his PhD in theology at Cambridge at the moment, and he wrote a great article this past August called, Sing to God for My Sake. I'm just going to read to you a a chunk of this article because uh, he says it so well. Here's what Tyler writes, and he's, he, he writes about a time he's just come off the stage, he's preached on the same text we're looking at today, Colossians 3, 16, and here's what he writes. In a long conversation after the service, This lady was emotional as she spoke about how freeing the message had been. The English translation of this verse can hide the fact that it is a group command. The you in dwell in you richly is plural. So my sermon focused on how the word of Christ dwells among a group of people. Our new friend said she realized that she had been burdening herself with the task of hearing the voice of God by His Word. With her own challenges and mental health issues, she had found it difficult to consistently do this and so was afflicted by guilt. But she saw that it was not all up to her. She is part of a community that is meant to do this together. We do not stand single file waiting for a turn at the rich well of God's Word. The rope which draws the bucket is meant to be raised as a group and the water shared communally. It was so great to see how freeing this was for her and it was a special joy because it wasn't something I had said directly or even thought of. She realized that by placing us before the gospel as a community, Colossians 3.16 frees us from a burden of unachievable self-sufficiency. I love that line. Maybe some of you need to be freed from an unachievable self-sufficiency. You think it's all up to you, whatever encounter you have with God, that's all on you. It's not. We're in this as a community. We're drawing the rope together. And so, When you are struggling to hold on, your brother or sister in Christ is there sharing communally with you the richness of God's Word. But right now, you might be thinking, well, we're all separate, Dave, in our own homes. How can we experience this while we're in isolation? I'm suggesting to you that we keep singing, (laughs) even though it's super awkward when we're not together. That's true. There is no denying that, no argument here. But the reality is, is that when you sing alone, you are not actually starting anything, and you are not actually alone. When we sing, we are joining our voices with the faithful throughout all of history. You are now gathered around the throne of God when you begin to open your mouth, standing next to the saints and angels and all of creation and singing the song that John hears in Revelation 5. 13, to him who sits on the throne, that is God the Father, and to the Lamb, that is God the Son, be praise and honor and glory and power forever and ever. So yes, even though we're physically distant for the moment, we are still drawing the rope together. We are drinking in the Word together. We are standing next to the saints, the faithful lovers of God throughout all of history, and the angels, and each other too when we stand and raise our voices in song. 
Uh, this friend of mine this week pointed out, we were talking about this idea, and he pointed out the kids' movie Moana. Full disclosure, I actually haven't seen it, not all the way through, I've seen chunks of it. But there's a, I, I looked up this scene, and, and the main character, Moana, she's out on the ocean on a boat, totally alone, and she's discouraged. She's even despondent, you might say. She's got a task in front of her, and she doesn't even want to do it. It's an important task. And she's standing there, and then all of a sudden she begins to hear a song of an ancestor of hers, a grandmother, who begins to sing and reminds her of who she is, that she's loved and lovely. And then she begins to open her mouth, and as she sings, this song begins to remind her of the fact that she is not alone, that she is a part of a bigger story, that she's a part of a bigger people. Like the writer of Hebrews in chapter 12 says, just after recounting uh, the reality that so many have gone before us in faith, we're told, don't give up. Look at, notice, there's a great cloud of witnesses. Those who have gone before you, they've been faithful, and now they're cheering you on as you run the ways. So notice them and fix your eyes on Jesus who's gone before you. So you are not alone. You never were. We are not alone And so even in your home, awkward as it is, engage your body, stand up, sing. Is it awkward? Probably. My suggestion, do it anyways. Turn up the TV or or your device so you don't feel like you're the only voice in the room. Stand. Raise your hands, also a biblical command, by the way, and do it because God is worthy of it, even when it's awkward. Now back to Tyler's article. I, he's got this one example. I just love it. I need to share it with you. What I especially want to point out is that part of how we draw each other to the gospel is singing to God. I, I got a picture of how this works at a church the kids and I were attending for a few months. Participation, like in the singing and worship, was lively as a rule, but there was one man that I will never forget. I never did look around to figure out who it was, but about Two-thirds the way through the singing, this man would begin, for lack of better terms, to bellow. Melody was not abandoned, but it was no longer the primary aim. The goal was to project the words with a power and passion that equaled their significance. And he sang like his chest was strained to keep his heart tethered to his body. It was like standing on a sea cliff with an onshore wind testing your balance. This was a powerful moment for me whenever it happened. Here my family and I were undeniably in the presence of people who knew that all which they sang was true. There was no question that this man believed the words of the gospel which we sang together. What it accomplished was an increased richness with which the word of Christ dwelt among us. When we sing in church, we first and foremost sing with thankfulness in our hearts to God, but we also sing for each other. There will always be people among us who are struggling to see and believe the good news of Jesus Christ. Every time the church gathers, there are people like my friend who need sturdy reminders that they are amongst people who know these things are true. The way to approach public worship is to sing as though the person three seats up from you desperately needs a reminder that the words you're singing are true because the reality is they do need that reminder. The next time, he says, your church can gather to sing, stand before the gospel together. Listen well to your brothers' and sisters' voices and let these bellows feed the furnace of your own faith. Remember that you do not see the struggles that weigh upon your church family. And I just would point out, I believe that when Tyler was referring to this, it wasn't long after he had lost his wife to cancer. It was just him and and his kids. So he needed this in this moment. Let me continue. Consider that someone near you may be in dire need of hearing what the next line of the song says. Take to heart that your voice in song is part of how they must hear the voice of God in the gospel. That's what happens 
when we sing together. It's a service to each other. One last very brief point. Singing builds and expresses our unity in Christ. We live in a time of deep division in our sort of cultural moment. That might be a bit of an understatement even. (laughs) But Jesus' heart for his community is that we be united in love around him and his heart no matter what. And singing is one of the key avenues for building and then expressing that unity. Bob Coughlin notes, our singing tends to bind us together. It's more effective than simply reciting or shouting words in unison. Singing enables us to spend extended periods of time communicating the same thoughts, the same passions, and the same intentions. That process can actually have a physical effect on our bodies. Scientists have found out that singing corporately produces a chemical change in our bodies that contributes to a sense of bonding. Wow. So even our neuroscience is wired for us to sing together and then be formed as a community as a result. So what we need to see today, what we've looked at today, is that our spiritual health and wholeness incorporates and even requires our bodies to be involved, our physical selves, not just our minds. And our spiritual health is a part of our connection to the whole body of Christ. That is, it is a corporate work to be spiritually formed. So sing to God, for he is worthy of all of our praise. We really do have a song, and it goes like this. Worthy is the lamb who is slain. Worthy are you, Jesus, because you gave your all to make us yours forever. Sing to remind your heart of the good news. Sing to draw near to him and sing for others. For the voice of God and his good news actually and truly come through your voice as you sing for those around you. Let it be so. I'm going to pray as the worship team comes and leads us in a song. Let's pray and then sing together. God, you are good. Your love endures forever. You have given us a song, a song of love. And our song is simply a response to the song that you first sing over us that we are your beloved children, that through Jesus we can belong to you forever. So maybe there's someone who's even listening in today and and doesn't yet know you. God, I pray that your spirit would be doing a work right now of of, uh, cracking open their hearts to see the wonder of what you've done and that they might maybe even today begin to confess you as the Lord and King and join their hearts and voices with us. Something that will change them forever that will put them with you forever. We give you thanks that through these songs, you speak words of hope and life over us, and we get to praise you back. So God, take this offering, take it, remind us of who you are, remind us of who we are, for your glory, Lord, and for our joy. Amen.
Family, we have a reason to sing in every season because God is good. He's good. His love endures forever. So may we let the whole of us, mind, body, spirit, all bound up together and together as God's people be about his praises for the wonderful things he's done. May you go in his grace, may you rest in his peace this week, and may you engage your voices as well throughout this week in song to the one who loves us. Amen.